Good evening, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to Second Opinion. As tonight, we have our investigator faculty discussing cases from their colleagues that we're going to be presenting here this evening. We do have a great faculty uh, today from the far side here, uh, Dr. Alicia Morgans from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Professor Kareem Fazazi from the University of Paris-Saclay, Dr. Raina McKay from the University of La Jolla, California, uh, Dr. Emmanuel Antonakis, University of Minnesota, and Dr. Oliver Sarter from the Mayo Clinic in uh, Rochester. Uh, we're going to be uh, presenting cases uh, that we've uh, produced over the last couple weeks. So let's jump uh, right into that. Uh, as I mentioned, we have three uh, docs who work with me over the last couple weeks to put together some cases. Uh, Dr. Neeraj Agarwal from the Huntsman Cancer Institute at the University of Utah, uh, a medical oncologist, uh, Dr. David Morris uh, from the Urology Associates in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. He's a urologist. And Dr. Sandy Srinivas, uh, a medical oncologist from uh, Stanford. Uh, here are the modules that we're going to be covering tonight. Each one of these, we're, we're going to have a short uh, presentation from the faculty, but we'll precede that with some uh, case discussions. And we're going to start out uh, with this first case uh, from Dr. Uh, Morris. And uh, Raina, I'm going to ask after you uh, watch this case to respond to it. Uh, this is a 71-year-old man. I was really interested to see what Dr. Morris, as a urologist, uh, thought about the Embark study that was presented here in Chicago just about a month ago. Uh, and so he uh, pulled this case from his practice that I thought would be a good opportunity to really dive into it. Here's the case. So this is uh, a case of a 71-year-old man who had undergone a prostatectomy over 10 years ago. And just over the last year or so, he's had a PSA rise 0.18 and then 0.4. Uh, PSA doubling time estimated there just over six months, and a PSMA PET scan, which was negative for uptake anywhere. So uh, would you consider this an Embark-like situation? This would certainly be somebody whose PSA doubling time under nine months. He hasn't reached the threshold that Embark used, which was a PSA of one for post-surgical patients. But obviously, with just a few more months, he'd be a candidate for combination therapy or monotherapy and potential withdrawal therapy after a duration of induction. For a patient like this, putting aside reimbursement, FDA, all that, for a patient like this, would you offer intermittent enzalutamide monotherapy without ADT as an option in addition to the option of ADT plus enzalutamide? I would with the appropriate risk counseling. I do think it's reasonable to try enzalutamide and I would pitch it to a patient as we still may need to use ADT therapy down the road with all of its concomitant side effects. So, uh, Raina, I was very excited when I saw the, the presentation. We actually had uh, Dr. Shore the next day in a satellite meeting. We're waiting for the patient recorded outcomes, but, and you're going to talk about the study, but can you just sort of brief the audience a little bit on what they looked at in the study and what your takeaway was of it? No, very, uh, uh, really a landmark study actually. So Embark was a large phase three trial looking at patients who had biochemically recurrent disease that was non-metastatic. Um, they didn't incorporate PSMA PET imaging into the context of Embark. They enrolled patients that had a rapid PSA doubling time that was less than nine months and patients were actually randomized to one of three arms, either luprolide with enzalutamide, enzalutamide monotherapy or luprolide monotherapy. Um, the primary endpoint of the study was um, MFS and OS, and the intentions for comparisons, you know, the, the three arms weren't all intended to be compared to one another, but rather the primary endpoint was really designed around the combination of ADT plus enzalutamide being compared to luprolide alone. And I think this was really a really a uh, practice changing study that demonstrated that those patients that have a rapid PSA doubling time really seem to benefit from therapy escalation in the biochemically recurrent setting. We don't have data comparing luprolide plus enzalutamide versus enzalutamide. The trial was not designed to compare those um, subsets, but I think the trial demonstrated that there was a statistically significant improvement in MFS and OS actually with combination therapy. Now the enzalutamide monotherapy was um, not, evaluation of the enzalutamide monotherapy um, cohort was not the primary endpoint of the study, but it did, did provide 
prospective modern day evidence of what um, you know, enzalutive monotherapy were to look like. I think when we look at the AE profiles, we don't have the quality reported um, outcomes, the patient reported outcomes, but when we look at the AE profiles of enzyme monotherapy, you know, they're not actually all that different. We were chatting about this a little bit earlier. They're not all that different from luprolide alone, barring the exception of the hot flashes, which were significantly reduced in the enzalutamide monotherapy arm. And you would expect sexual function, although I don't know that they've reported that yet, but, you know, normal testosterone levels. So let's just uh, take a couple parts of this. Uh, first, Emmanuel, you know, you were at Hopkins before, and, you know, one thing just to put in context, we know a lot of people are sort of new to oncology, maybe a quarter of the people here are within the first five or eight years of being in oncology. You know, when you put in the major issue here, which is just doing a randomized trial in M0 disease, I don't think it was done before. They, we always look to the Hopkins historic data, trying to figure out what to do. Oh, we can never do a study like that. And then all of a sudden industry comes along after powering through hormone sensitive disease, M0 castrate sensitive, you know, grind, and then this incredible phase three study. So can you put that in context a little bit, Emmanuel, and also the trend that we're seeing in general of endocrine therapy intensification going all the way down the line? You know, Neil, not every patient with a biochemical recurrence needs therapy. So the, the main Hopkins contribution was that the PSA doubling time, the rate of PSA rise after definitive local therapy, that is very strongly prognostic. And PSA doubling time of less than nine months is pretty bad. Those patients, their natural history is that they'll develop a metastasis within two to four years. Whereas someone who has a PSA doubling time more than two years, they might not develop a metastasis for eight to 10 years. So the Embark study did not answer the question, when should we start ADT? But it did answer the question, if a patient warrants the uh, initiation of ADT, does the addition of enzalutamide provide uh, benefit uh, beyond ADT alone? And I think that was the question. And to select for high-risk patients, it still took six years to meet the, meet the primary endpoint, even with the high-risk patients. They said, okay, we'll pick the, those guys that have a PSA doubling time less than nine months. So if this becomes FDA approved, it's important to mention that this moment in time, enzalutamide does not have an FDA approval either as a monotherapy in the M0 biochemical recurrent patients or in combination with luprolide, but it might in the near future. Um, and if it does, I think that the main lesson from this study is if you have a rapid doubling time less than nine months, definitely less than six months, and your patient's um, longevity is otherwise uh, long enough from other health issues that it's reasonable to add enzalutamide. The, the monotherapy question, I, I'm not convinced myself that the, the benefits in terms of AE reduction are enough. So yeah, we're having a big argument about this. Of course, I'm completely naive. They're the ones with all the, but I was all excited when I saw mm -hmm. that not only uh, did, it was enzalutamide, intermittent enzalutamide therapy, which personally, I mean, though you all have done it, I never even heard of it, uh, but was actually better than ADT, hazard rate 0.63 or something like that. And the other thing is, and get, just to get before Oliver comments, I mean, can you see yourself, if you decide that a patient needs ADT or M0 disease, can, do you think it's justifiable to use an LHRH uh, agonist alone when you see a hazard rate of you know, 0.4 something when you add in ezalutamide? Emmanuel? Are you asking about ENZA alone? No, I'm asking about, can you see yourself using LHRH agonist alone? Less likely now, less likely. So of course the big issue, and this is what we were arguing about, I was all excited that intermittent enzalutamide monotherapy sounded really exciting to me. You know, actually, uh, maybe before you comment, Kareem, you know, we were talking also about high dose bicalutamide has been studied in the past. Again, for those new to uh, oncology, there was actually a 9,000 patient study, adjuvant trial done in like 2000, right? Kareem looking at bicalutamide. So a lot of people got experience, although I don't think it was intermittent at that point. Can you comment on sort of what we knew, Kareem, before about, um, let's say, androgen receptor signaling, whether it's bicalutamide or enzalutamide by itself without ADT? Right. The, uh, I mean, theoretically, at least, the beauty of uh, AR targeting alone without uh, ADT is that testosterone level will, will be preserved and actually will, will even increase. Uh, so uh, potentially you can uh, protect this part of the sexual life of these patients. Uh, 
and, uh, and also uh, avoid some uh, side effects of androgen deprivation therapy. Uh, having said that, the, gyne the gynecomastia is a clear side effect of this treatment when used as a single agent, and uh, it can be painful. It can be socially an issue. Uh, I mean, many of these patients are telling me I cannot go anymore to the beach or to the pool or, you know, uh, or with my little children, I feel uncomfortable, you know, all these things. So um, one way to, to prevent that uh, when really you have to or you make the decision to use an AR pathway inhibitor or an AR uh, in, in inhibitor actually uh, alone is to irradiate the, the breast as a prophylactic treatment with very loud dose, uh, not at all radiation therapy for, for breast cancer, obviously. It's very loud dose, just one fraction. And it actually works. Uh, so this is something that, uh, that people can, can consider. I'm not using bicalutamide uh, alone very often, I have to say. I'm doing that probably in two situations. One is a situation where I'm facing someone at very high risk for cardiovascular complications of ADT, but still he has a bad prostate cancer, so I want to treat him. And the other situation, which is actually rare, is also someone who is telling me no, no, no for ADT for sexual reasons. Um, so, so those are my probably two indications. And probably I'm prescribing calutamide alone once every year or something like that, no more than that. So you were saying, uh, though, that also when you've used enzalutamide alone, sometimes you use half dose? Oh, I mean, enzalutamide, uh, that's more for, for, the, for the elderly. I, I think we, we, we all agree that enzalutamide has uh, cognitive uh, side effects with uh, intellectual fatigue, and that, that could really be an issue clinically in many patients, especially in the elderly. Uh, it's actually associated also with falls, mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, again, mostly in the elderly. And I suspect that the, the dose that was historically chosen a, a decade ago is probably just too high. Uh, and this is also because at this time we were doing phase one and trying to, to, to reach the highest tolerated dose, which may or may not be the right strategy for hormonal therapy. So. Um, uh, my policy is that if, I, if I'm using enzalutamide in a man, say, you know, more of more than 70 year old, I tend to use half the dose, uh, and maybe I, I will dose increase or maybe not, um, because I know it works. I don't have phase three, obviously, uh, but I know it, it, it typically works, and the side effect appear to be lower uh, with, with these doses. So I want to go on to the second case, and we could spend the entire time easily talking about this topic, and we probably should. Just a couple other points, though. So again, Oliver, I was all excited about the possibility of at least offering to the patient the possibility of avoiding ADT and at least trying enzalutamide alone. I thought, well, hey, maybe they'll have better sexual function, less hot flashes, et cetera, yet you still have concerns. Well, just very briefly, because I know we need to move on, but I want to be a contrarian. That patient could have been treated with radiation and potentially Agreed. cured. So salvage radiation therapy. So we had the SPORT trial, published in Lancet, 1,500 patients, three arms, radiation to the FOSA, FOSA radiation in combination with four to six months of ADT are a larger field of radiation, so three arms. Bottom line is, at seven years, the probability of progression was only around 15% with four to six months of hormonal therapy and salvage radiation. That patient could have been cured. So I'm not even sure I would use the intermittent hormones. I'll try to cure them first. Hmm. Uh, Alicia, any thoughts about, again, a quality of life in this situation? Can, uh, we were waiting for the data. We're going to see the data. Dr. Shore, who was actually in the satellite we had the next day, was talking about that. But what do you expect? I don't know how much experience you already have with enzalut intermittent enzalutamide monotherapy. Sure, but just before I get to that, I want to emphasize what Oliver said, because I think that we should really think about the Embark data in the context of a maximally treated pelvis and prostate sure, area. Sure, of course, yes. So just to emphasize that. But, yes. um, so I have not personally used intermittent enzalutamide. I've used intermittent other um, AR signaling inhibitors. And I think that, at least from a patient's perspective, 
there can be those patients, as Kareem said, that want to, to emphasize this ability to maybe increase testosterone, which is what we see with the AR antagonists given as single agents, because they do have some quality of life benefits. They may have retention of muscle mass, maybe less weight gain, um, but the gynecomastia, from my perspective, is probably the most limiting effect. And if we have strategies to mitigate that, I, I think that this can be a really potentially very patient-friendly alternative. And when the patient reported outcomes from Embark are available, I think we're all going to be really curious to see how our considerations and concerns when it comes to CTCAE, which is you know the doctors and the clinicians as we rate our concerning side effects, really stack up against what the, the patients say in terms of their fatigue, their sexual function, um, and their overall quality of life. There may be a disconnect and they may feel better, be happier. We don't know, we'll have to see. I mean, from the point of view of you know clinical medicine, quality of life, patient care, to me, this study is epic. And I mean in oncology, not just in prostate cancer. I just took my breath away. All right, real quick case for you, Raina. Uh, this is from uh, Sandy Srinivas. 73-year-old male, Gleason 4 plus 4, pathologic T3A, had N1 disease. Unfortunately, postoperatively, he had PSA persistence and it was confirmed with a rise a month later. He gets a PSMA scan that's negative. The plan is for him to have radiation along with ADT intensification. So patient gets abiraterone and within a month, he's in the emergency room with hypertension, palpitations, headache, and he has a T-billy of 12.0. Clearly has a drug-induced liver enzyme abnormality. The ABI was discontinued and fortunately showed resolution. So the question that I have for the panel is, who can get re-challenged with ABI? Are there alternates to abiraterone? Like could enzalutamide be substituted in this case? It would also be nice to know how frequently do you monitor liver enzymes? Any thoughts, Raina? No, I think this is a situation that we um, encounter not infrequently in clinical practice. And quite honestly, we don't really have level one evidence to guide just exactly what to do for those patients that have persistently positive PSAs post-RP or have pathologically positive nodes at the time of radical prostatectomy. What is the right therapy for these individuals. I think there are clinical trials that are being conducted through the NRG that are looking at actually addressing what is the role of therapy escalation in this context, but we don't actually have prospective data at the present time. I think we try to extrapolate from the stampede data, try to extrapolate from um, you know, what we're doing in the metastatic hormone sensitive disease setting, understanding that this is a pretty high risk patient population where we want to kind of you know, escalate those individuals with the addition of abiraterone. Um, you know, I think with regards to monitoring for abiraterone toxicity, technically on label, patients should be undergoing Q2 week um, LFT and, um, you know, potassium check, making sure that they're actually taking their medications appropriately, making sure they're actually taking the prednisone appropriately to limit the amount of mineralocorticoid excess that is seen. You know, sometimes a lot of patients, especially our older individuals, they're on statins, they're on other medications, they may have a little bit of alcohol, a little bit of Tylenol for their arthritis, and all of that can potentially come in to play with regards to the liver toxicity. So I think education is really important, um, informing patients about these potential side effects and guarding against them, um, you know, making sure patients have a blood pressure cuff, they're checking their pressures at home, um, and, you know, trying to identify those high-risk individuals up front, like that may already be on one or two BP medications when you go ahead and start them on the abiraterone. What about her question of putting on an AR blocker at this point? You know, I think the data are really quite limited um, for, you know, I think just exactly what to do in this setting. I think the most data that we have comes from Stampede with the use of abiraterone, but we don't necessarily have prospective data. Now, in clinical practice, would I potentially sub out um, abiraterone if somebody really was intolerant to it and they're potentially high risk? I mean, it's having that shared conversation with the patient to discuss risk benefit, but we don't really have level one evidence to say that, yes, this is the right thing to do. All right, Alicia, let's take a look at some data. Great. 
So we're going to talk about the current management of non-metastatic prostate cancer. And as has already been said, I think one of the most important things to remember about this population in the hormone-sensitive or castration-resistant setting is that there are, uh, there's a heterogeneity of the population where we can really see that some patients will have very slow progression to metastatic disease or death from prostate cancer, but we'll see where, that other patients certainly are at very high risk for those complications. And this is a, a chart that actually was alluded to earlier uh, by Emanuel from some Johns Hopkins analyses that looked at PSA doubling time and the association between this and the rate of uh, prostate-specific survival. And we can see that in this hormone-sensitive biochemical recurrent population, there's a clear association with a shorter PSA doubling time clearly being associated with a greater risk of developing a death from prostate cancer. Um, and in the castration-resistant non-metastatic setting, we see the same thing. And here we can see an inflection point somewhere between seven and nine months, suggesting that as our PSA doubling time hits that very short time frame uh, or, or low level, we can see such an increase in the risk of developing metastatic disease and death from prostate cancer. As we think about choosing androgen deprivation therapy, one thing that we think about in the non-metastatic setting is intermittent therapy. And the HERO trial demonstrated that relagolix may be another option for androgen deprivation therapy in this particular setting, or in any setting, of course. But this was a randomization for patients who needed at least a year of treatment between relagolix and luprolide, so a GnRH antagonist and a GnRH agonist. They looked to see if they, re they really achieved similar levels of castration at a 48-week time point and found that they were actually similarly able to achieve castration and that relagolix may even be slightly superior to luprolide in that context. What we can see on the right is that there was a faster uh, increase in testosterone to uh, normal levels in those patients who were treated with relagolix when compared to luprolide at that time point after treatment. And so sometimes as we're thinking about intermittent therapy and we want fast on in terms of lowering of testosterone and fast off in terms of resolution of, of treatment, this may be something that's attractive to us. Additionally, we have to recognize that relagolix may be associated with a lower rate of major adverse cardiovascular vascular event, as was also demonstrated in this study, as you can see on the left, a 54% lower risk of major adverse cardiovascular event associated with relagolix versus luprolide. And that seemed to be most pronounced among patients who had a history of a previous MACE event, so a heart attack, a stroke in the past, perhaps making them the highest risk patients to be treated with androgen deprivation therapy. Moving on, we have alluded to this as well, that those patients with non-metastatic but locally advanced prostate cancer also are patients that we want to intensify. And this was ass assessed in the STAMPEDE trial where patients, as you can see in that upper right green box, who had node-positive disease or at least two of each of the T3, T4, PSA greater than 40, or Gleason greater than 8 criteria could uh, be enrolled in the stampede trial for non-metastatic disease, in which patients who were being treated with radiation to the prostate with definitive intent were randomized to receive ADT and abiraterone with or without enzalutamide or ADT alone. What we can see is those patients who had the intensified hormonal therapy had a better metastasis-free survival in this particular curve as well as a better overall survival in this curve. And we can see that that hazard ratio suggests a 40% reduction in mortality with that intensified strategy in this non-metastatic but high-risk patient population. Presto was a more recently published study of patients with biochemical recurrence. This is a hormone-sensitive biochemical recurrence, high-risk population, and a really interesting study that came out of the Alliance. And this patient population had a PSA doubling time of less than or equal to nine months, so they had biochemical recurrence with a PSA of greater than 0.5. Patients were randomized one to one to one to receive treatment with an LHRH analog or that plus apalutamide or the ADT plus apalutamide plus abiraterone, and they were followed for PSA progression. What we can see is that apalutamide plus ADT prolonged PSA progression-free survival in this population versus ADT alone, and that when we added abiraterone as well, we continued to see this prolongation of, uh, of that PSA progression-free survival. So this intensified strategy could prolong PSA uh, progression-free survival, and this was really assessed and confirmed in patients who had testosterone recovery, which is so important when we're thinking about uh, PSA progression. When testosterone recovers, of course, patients are more likely to have PSA progression if the disease persists. 
We've been talking a lot about Embark uh, tonight, and we know that this is a patient population, again, with high risk biochemical recurrence. This is a castrate-sensitive or hormone-sensitive biochemical recurrence in patients with a PSA of one or greater if they are post-prostatectomy or at least two nanograms above the nadir uh, per those criteria in patients treated with, uh, with radiation. And they had to have that PSA doubling time of less than or equal to nine months. Randomized here again to enzalutamide and luprolide versus uh, enzalutamide alone versus luprolide alone, as we heard recently. And they were followed uh, after they, they, they were continued to be followed for about 37 uh, uh, weeks. And they, uh, if they achieved a PSA of less than 0.2, they were able to do an intermittent approach to their systemic therapy. So they could stop systemic therapy. If they did not achieve that really low PSA level, then they did have to remain on their therapy. They were then followed for a metastasis-free survival endpoint. So here we can see the, the, the curves for MFS, and we see that enzalutamide plus ADT was associated with prolonged metastasis-free survival as compared to ADT alone in this high-risk biochemical recurrent population. We can see that there was a, a trend, perhaps, towards overall survival being improved with the uh, combination, but I would say here that this is very immature and, and a long way to go in this particular analysis. And then what we can see on the next slide is that enzalutamide versus ADT was also studied, as we mentioned, and we also see a prolonged metastasis-free survival for enzalutamide alone versus that ADT alone. Importantly, again, this is an intermittent strategy for patients who achieve that low PSA. Um, these are the, the side effects or some of the side effects that we have been talking about tonight. And there are, they're generally very similar between the arms, but we can see that hot flashes are lower in those patients receiving enzalutamide monotherapy, whereas if we look at the very bottom, gynecomastia and nipple pain actually higher in enzalutamide monotherapy. Fatigue similar across the board. So what this is going to look like in our practices I think remains to be seen. We'll have to figure this one out. And then to, to close, non-metastatic CRPC, of course, is something that we've been thinking about for several years. Three studies, Spartan, Prosper, and Aramis, assessed these, um, these populations and looked at ADT versus ADT plus apalutamide, darolutamide, or enzalutamide, and all had a metastasis-free survival endpoint. The combination therapy prolonged metastasis-free survival in all of these studies, demonstrating that ADT plus an AR signaling inhibitor was superior in all, and also superior in terms of prolonging overall survival across the trials. And so, patient selection is really important in this non-metastatic patient population. Abiraterone, when, ad when added to ADT in combination with radiation, prolongs survival in high-risk, locally advanced prostate cancer, as we saw with Stampede. Intensified treatment with ADT and apalutamide can prolong PFS in high-risk biochemical recurrence. ADT and enzalutamide prolongs MFS in high-risk BCR. And intensified treatment with ADT and enzalutamide, apalutamide, or darolutamide prolongs MFS and OS in non-metastatic CRPC. Thank you. Kind of interesting to think about the fact we've been using ADT for a long, long time, and we just, even enzalutamide monotherapy beat it. So we'll see. I guess another question I was thinking about, Kareem, is what do we know about apalutamide and darolutamide without ADT? Without ADT? Um, actually, apalutamide was tested in a, in a trial in Brazil. Uh, it actually showed very consistent data as what we, we just saw. Um, it works. Uh, whether it's good enough and uh, well tolerated enough to justify use, not sure at all. For darolutamide, a randomized trial is ongoing in Europe. Uh, I don't think the data have been reported. I, I, won't, I won't comment on that, but this is, this is ongoing. Darolutamide, I mean, appears to be quite well tolerated, generally speaking. So, so the, the hope is really that the side effects we saw with enzalutamide or apalutamide <coughs> as a single agent will be lower with darolutamide, but this remains obviously to be, to be demonstrated as a single agent. We just don't know. Just kind of curious, show of hands of the people here in the audience. How many of you actually have used enzalutamide, darolutamide, uh, or uh, apalutamide without ADT? Okay, <laughs> good census. All right, here's another <laughs> issue that kind of I wasn't really thinking too much about, and actually this next case made me think a lot about, which is just the issue about intermittent therapy. And I guess somehow along the line, I didn't realize the importance of what the form of ADT was. 
But there's a big difference between using an antagonist, derogolics or relagolics, versus an agonist, LHR, um, lupride or, or gaserolin. And this is brought out by this case uh, from Dr. Agarwal, uh, a patient uh, who ended up uh, getting uh, relagolics uh, intermittently. Here's the case. This patient had detectable PSA of 0.1 nanogram per mil two years after radiation. Now, five years after radiation, in 2020, PSA is 10.2, conventional scans are negative. And then finally, he's decided to start intermittent ADT. So how is this man doing at this point? He's doing great. Happy with the real break. He is in his break period or off period. He started Relicolex. The PSA goes down very quickly to less than four within two months. And then he took a break. Break lasted for five months. And then once he restarted, again, the PSA goes down. We achieved the goal rapidly. And then break period usually lasts for four to five months. So Oliver, any thoughts? You know, when, when I first started hearing about the uh, antagonist, I, we, I was focused on the cardiovascular issue. And I wasn't really thinking about the, the, how quick you get recovery. Can you kind of talk a little bit about how that plays out? Sure. So if we go to the original agonist, that'd be lupulide type drugs, it turns out that you may give them for six months, but there's a pretty persistent lowering of the testosterone that can go on for much longer. I think one of the advantages of the antagonists, as opposed to the agonists like rogolics, you get pretty rapid reversibility. So in an intermittent approach, you definitely have the advantage of being able to see on again, off again, on again, off again, with reversibility so the testosterone is a little more controllable. Using the agonist, the testosterone can take a long time to recover. Raina, any comments about relagolics? You know, it's an oral agent, which would th seem to be an advantage, uh, although potentially maybe more difficult to access. Uh, and what are your thoughts about the cardiovascular link? Uh, how much, what type of cardiovascular profile will get you to want to use these drugs more? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. I think um, I like what um, Alicia said about, you know, the fast on, fast off approach with regards to a relagolics with an oral medication, um, especially those individuals that have a history of a prior cardiovascular event. I think those are the people that worry me the most that have cardiovascular risk factors, or maybe I'm worried about tolerance. Um, you know, that's the beauty about Relagolix is it's an oral pill. If you run into trouble with it, you can easily stop it. And the time to testosterone recovery is a lot quicker when you discontinue therapy. And additionally, there is, even though the rates of cardiovascular events in the context of the HERO trial were low in general, there did seem to be a benefit with having an antagonist on board as opposed to an agonist probably driven by the effect of FSH and more rapid lowering of FSH. So I do think that there is, um, you know, beauty to having this oral fast on, fast off option. And uh, for the general medical oncologists in the audience, which I think there are quite a few, you immediately will start seeing analogies to breast cancer. And on Monday night, we're gonna talk about the issue of tamoxifen alone compared to tamoxifen plus LHR agonists. And clinically, although they're different diseases, it, the oncologists will start begin to see that maybe there's a paradigm that we're gonna talk about Monday night in breast that's well fleshed out that may be starting to come into, um, into prostate cancer. We'll see. Here's another uh, very fascinating issue uh, that I hadn't really thought much about. This is an 82-year-old man, a patient of Dr. Mars. 82-year-old male treated prostatectomy 15 years ago and then had radiotherapy for PSA recurrence. He started ADT for that PSA recurrence. His PSA did drop, but it only nadir to 3.0, which is kind of a concerning finding for any of us, and then started rising again. And now the PSA doubling time is six months. He had a CT and bone scan imaging for staging. This has been years ago, so there was no PSMA PET or fluciclovine PET available. It was kind of confirmed as non-metastatic CRPC with a quickly rising PSA, and so he started on apalutamide. He had a response with a PSA drop to undetectable. He eventually had to have a dose reduction due to fatigue, but he has been on apalutamide for five years now with a PSA drop to undetectable and on most recent imaging has a CT and bone scan with no metastatic disease noted. So the question I think clinically coming from many of this is with the idea of Embark where you're inducing and getting good responders, 
is when is it appropriate to de-escalate therapy? She's tolerating the medication, but it's a more of a having to apply for grants, having to try to get the drug in his hands and his out-of-pocket exposure. And he'd just like to come off therapy if he could. So Kareem, I'm curious, when I heard this case, I'm like, does this really happen? So I'm curious, have you seen cases like this? Do you ever stop therapy? Any role, uh, I mean, uh, uh, any thoughts about uh, how you might uh, manage this? And also, why is this tumor or this patient different than everybody else who doesn't do as well? Any speculations biologically? Wow, do, do that hard questions to answer, especially the last one. Um, I, I'll start with the first one, which is, uh, if I recall it well, did I see similar patients? Answer is yes. Uh, we, we do see, I mean, as we were using more and more the AR pathway inhibitor earlier um, in various settings of, uh, of a disease, we do see very long-term survivors with complete responses, basically, including by PSA. And uh, what Dr. Morris uh, is asking as a question is, is a key one. Uh, I, honestly, I don't have the answer, but, but it's really tempting to go for de-escalation in some patients. I tend to do it, especially when the treatment is not well tolerated, because actually, actually this is easier. Um, and this is true also uh, with ADT, to be honest. For example, in, in metastatic hormone-sensitive setting, I had some patients benefiting for you know, five years, 10 years, 15 years, and sometimes, honestly, uh, I, I tend to, to stop. But we, we need guidance. We, we just don't know what is good, what is bad, when should we um, stop and when, when we should not. We are about to, to launch a, a phase three trial for men with, uh, who are good responders um, uh, after uh, ADT plus intensification for metastatic hormone sensitive disease, not exactly the same setting as, as this gentleman. Uh, in Europe, and this is gonna randomize for patients with intactable PSA at six months uh, just carry on with the treatment classically versus discontinuation and restart uh, in case of a progression. Uh, and I think this will be a very important trial to conduct. But I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I really don't have a, an answer to provide to, to Dr. Morris. I, I would be tempted, especially in an 82-year gentleman, to, to make a pose. But this is really things we need to, to discuss openly with patients, uh, sharing you know, the lack of evidence and the pros and cons. So if you remember all the questions, it's like a cognitive test. You left out the one of biologically what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I've tried my best to avoid it. <laughs> um, Different androgen receptor. Yeah, no, obviously um, some, some prostate cancer are very, very, very driven by the androgen receptor machinery. This is an obvious thing. Now, uh, and actually many men who die from prostate cancer do die with an active AR machinery ongoing, which means that we should keep targeting AR in, in many situations of advanced prostate cancer. But why, I mean, we, we do have some ex potential explanation, biologically speaking. For example, SPOP predicts for um, quite um, acquisite um, uh, uh, hormone sensitivity. Uh, but, but I'm quite sure we don't understand everything, to be honest. There are probably some other biomarkers that, that we need to, to identify. So, Oliver, like your thoughts, and also, you know, I learn so much when I meet with the faculty. We sit down for about 45 minutes. We come in there, they're like blasting me with all kinds of stuff. And one of the things you mentioned that you got to tell them about is this trial with the oligomets and the mm -hmm. lutetium and again. So, any thoughts about Kareem's uh, comments and then about this trial? Sure. So, you know, one comment, there's been a little bit of work that looks at the transcriptomics, and you can kind of divide these into luminal and basal, and you can look at luminal A and B, and it turns out that there's differential sensitivity to hormonal therapy, and that these basal sort of transcriptomic markers are a little less ADT responsive, and maybe the luminal B a little more. So there is kind of a luminal basal story that some people will, will play to. Uh, one of the things that I think is important to emphasize, and this gets to the second part of your question, is we're using a lot more PSMA PET under these circumstances. So imagine you just stop the ADT in this type of patient. And if his PSA does rise, then why don't we go look for it and see if we can find another PSMA PET? And some of the things that we can do might include what we call SPRT, stereotactic body radiotherapy. 
And when you see a little bit here and a little bit there, then sometimes we can control it quite well with the SPRT. So thinking ahead, just for a brief moment, because you know men don't like to be castrated, and we talk about ADT, and we talk about sort of systemic therapies, but what we're really talking about is castration. And men don't like that. So an alternative could be, and now we're gonna move forward into that PSMA-detected oligometastatic situation, giving SPRT as a standard of therapy, but now, instead of the ADT, we're gonna be adding in the PSMA lutetium in a randomized way. So this is a prospective randomized phase three trial but test is free survival endpoint, just like an Embark, and looking at the question of whether or not PSMA lutetium might inhibit the development and prolong the MFS, so inhibit the development of the So anyway, just another way of thinking about it, and that's going to be coming down the pike, probably be opening up this fall. It's really amazing how often I talk to these people, and I still hear things every day I've never heard. And another thing I heard, and Raina, maybe you want to comment on this, you know, I've heard about the scenario of the patient who, like in the past, an Embark would have been called M0, but they didn't have PSMA. Now you do the PSMA, and it's positive. And I just assume all these people get treated like hormone-sensitive Mets. I hear about the stories about oligomets, and, of course, that makes a lot of sense, but I assume that was unusual. And yet you all in the faculty room are telling me, actually, that's a very common thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, what fraction of people in that situation actually fit into this oligomet scenario, Reina? I think it's actually ever increasing with the increased utilization of PSMA PET imaging. I mean, at every single weekly tumor board that we have, we have a case being presented of somebody with negative conventional imaging and they've got some areas of potential disease on their PSMA PET and we're sitting there and scratching our heads like, is this real? Is this unequivocal? Should we biopsy it? Should we SBRT it? Are we going to wed this patient to lifelong hormonal therapy like they're, as if though they were an MSHPC patient? Or are we going to give SBRT alone? Or are we going to give SBRT with short course ADT? I think we don't have you know, prospective data to guide what to do at the present time, but there's a series of clinical trials, the one that Oliver described and others that are actually looking at that strategy of SBRT, short course ADT. I think these, these patients, I think, are a little bit different than patients that were overtly metastatic on conventional imaging. Yeah. You can't think of a better example of what's happened in oncology than prostate cancer. It was not that long ago that when we did a program, we were just like, what are we going to talk about? And now, tonight, in two hours, we're just going to touch on a lot of stuff. And I'll turn it over to Kareem for some more data. Sure, happy to. Thank you, Neil. So, um, I, I guess we, we, we all know for almost a decade now that we should intensify men with metastatic castration-sensitive disease. Uh, really clear benefit of intensification, multiple trials shown. Dostaxel was the first drug to, to show this benefit, and when first shown in charted, approximately 40% reduction in the risk of death was originally reported. Unfortunately, when a longer follow-up was achieved, in, not only in charted, but also in Stampy Dostaxel, it appeared that the benefit of dostaxel alone was lower than initially announced, approximately 20% reduction in the risk of, of death, not anymore 40%, better than nothing, obviously, but still patients die. And you see this, this banana kind of, of, of form, if you will, for the kaplan meier curves, maybe because we're just giving dostaxel for four months, not for continuously, and, and after some time, patients progress. Now, on the other hand, two, two years after that, uh, starting in 2017, we, we saw the eve of uh, um, second-generation AR pathway inhibitor starting, uh, first with abiratron in latitude and stampede, and the longer-term follow-up analysis of these two trials appeared, I mean, provided good news to us uh, with uh, a benefit uh, quite sustained. Uh, and approximately a 35% reduction in the risk of death, which, which, uh, which was great, obviously. This was confirmed with the other agents, enzalutamide and apalutamide, and the benefit appeared to be very similar to that of aberratron. Now, a key question, I guess, to us medical oncologists is really, should the systemic treatment defer according to metastatic burden, but also to timing of metastasis? and timing would be relapse versus de novo metastatic disease. 
And here I'd like to show you um, this, this picture, and let's say that those are your next 100 patients with metastatic castration sensitive disease, and they kind of appear to be the same, if you will. But, uh, and actually we, for a long time, we've been treating these patients the same with ADT alone, and we're still missing a biomarker to help us for decision-making. But still, if you're using simple criteria, clinical criteria, you will separate different scenarios. This gentleman here has the nerve disease and just a few meds, low burden, low volume, low risk, whatever we call it. This other gentleman also has the nerve disease. He was diagnosed today with his prostate cancer and the metastasis at the same time, but he has a really decimated disease with multiple meds. And then you have the two other scenarios, a recurrence with low burden disease, which is quite frequent amongst the uh, recurrences, and a rare situation of recurrence with high burden disease. Why uh, am I showing you these four things, these four scenarios? Just simply before, because their um, natural history is not the same, especially for patients with a recurrence and oligometastatic disease, their outcome is just much better. Even before the eve of all treatment intensification, the likelihood for survival was approximately eight years, as opposed to just, say, four years for the three other scenarios. So if you're pulling these patients with, with the other ones, just because of this, you, you can have different results, uh, uh, not necessarily depending on treatment, but just because of the biology of the disease. And also, and very importantly, we've been you know, kind of fighting sometimes about whether the stack cell should be used or not in both low volume and high volume disease, but it actually appears to be uh, confounded by this timing um, effect. And I'm saying that because uh, a meta-analysis of all uh, available trials clearly established that patients who relapse so metachronous patients and low volume, so oligometastic disease, just don't benefit from the stack cell chemotherapy. Those probably explaining why charted was negative for these patients. But the other three groups, so all the de novo, if you will, and the rare situation of relapse and multiple meds actually derive approximately the same benefit from the stack cell chemotherapy uh, approximately 10% reduction uh, in the risk of death. So, which means that in a patient with de novo disease, even if you're struggling as to whether you should use the stack cell, you actually can. I, and in your patient, statistically speaking, may benefit. I'm not saying all patients, of course, should receive it. Now, um, with second-generation AR pathway inhibitor, we saw efficacy across the board, low volume, high volume, also mostly because these patients had the nerve disease in the trials. Patients with relapse were very rare in all trials I've been speaking about today. The next question was obviously, should we even intensify further all a treatment, all a systemic treatment, and use three drugs instead of two? So this is why we did the PEACE-1 trial, which is asking two questions. One question is about systemic treatment, and the second question is about the radiation therapy directed to the primary. You'll need to wait for tomorrow morning, because this data will be first presented uh, at the Congress at the oral session tomorrow. But regarding the systemic treatment, we do have the data, and they're, they're positive. Clearly, if you're using three drugs, ADT, Dostaxel, and Aberatron, your patients will do better in terms of radiographic progression for survival, two years versus four and a half years. So you're providing basically two and a half additional year of good life to your patients, uh, adding just a, a third drug, and they will benefit also by overall survival with a 25% reduction in the risk of death. So if I'm trying to put this into perspective, and I chose here patients with the worst disease, de novo and high volume for comparison purposes. A, year, a decade ago, we were using ADT alone, and these patients would live three years max as a, as a median, very consistent across trials. Dostaxel improved survival with approximately 43 months, 
as a median, abiraterone 53, and now with the triplet treatment, these patients live over five years as a median survival. So in just a decade, we, we went away from less than three years to now more than five years, again, for those with the worst disease at presentation. Uh, what is the price to pay for patients in terms of toxicity? Uh, increase in uh, liver mats, in liver uh, trisaminase increase, sorry, 6% versus 1%. So it happens, you need to monitor. Hypertension, 22% versus 14% in those are, are grade 3 and 4. So again, please monitor your patients. N you know, not, nothing crazy to do and nothing uh, very difficult to do. This is now confirmed with the second phase 3 trial, Aracens, clean trial, testing ADT plus dostaxel plus or minus darvolutamide, and uh, clean answer, where overall survival is significantly improved with a 32% reduction in the risk of death, fairing the triplet uh, strategy. This is very consistent across the board. We now have Enzamet also, a subgroup of patients with, uh, from Enzamet, and you see it's really the same kaplan mayer curves. Um, again, in our sense, high-risk and low-risk patients were tested, and they tend to benefit you know, pretty much the same, with the caveat, of course, of subgroup analysis, uh, including sometimes small subgroups. So I guess there are many good reasons now to choose a triplet uh, a strategy in fit men with de novo metastatic disease, First, those agents don't work the same in terms of um, mechanism of action, and we know that one drug can circumvent resistance to the other one from q 301 a Fairman card. It goes both ways. We also know that this is a heterogeneous disease. We, again, we don't have a biomarker to help us to decide sh who should get X, who should get Y. So until we have that, we should probably better use uh, uh, poly treatments. And if ever you're using just a tablet, well, basically, the next step will be dostaxel, which doesn't work fantastically well in CRPC. So why not using it earlier, up, you know, up front, for better efficacy and less toxicity in a younger man and fitter man? And at the end of the day, really six cycles of dostaxel is just four, four and, and a half months, and mostly well tolerated with GCSF support, and I recognize that there are exceptions. If your patients did not tolerate it, just stop. So take a message is, I think the current standard has evolved. We should use for the novo high volume disease probably mostly a triplet. For those who aren't fit, just a tablet without chemo. For low volume, more difficult to say, and please wait for tomorrow for maybe more data. For patients relapsing, we need just to be extremely cautious. The, the trial, the phase three trials, actually did not include many men with relapses. So whatever we say, we need to be very cautious about this because it's very easy you know, to, to make mistakes. Uh, we also have to take care of patients in the elderly and sometimes we have to use ADT alone. I mean, when we have to, we have to. And most importantly, we need new trials, and those will be my last two slides. We have four big phase three trials currently ongoing, at least, actually more than that. Those are examples. Uh, PSM edition, I think, is a very important one, and uh, Oliver uh, is the chair. This is testing PSM elutation, but there are also others, and uh, for the sake of time, I will not detail all, all of them. We are also doing academic work, uh, and P6 is a platform of phase three trials, and we are focusing on different population of men, oligometastic disease, radiation to the mats, the vulnerable population, can we still intensify those patients with darvolutamide? And then we spoke about it, we're now we're just about, about to open two trials, one for good responders by PSA at six to eight months, the other one for poor responders, because we need to improve uh, the outcomes of these patients. Thank you so much. So uh, maybe just a no, sort of a second opinion. That was the name of this thing here. And I'm going to very humbly ask this question. And tomorrow night, you know, we're going to be jumping all over the myeloma people who want to give quadruplet therapy, transplant when there's no survival benefit. But OK, you want to present that to the patient as often, that's fine. But just you know, kind of let them know what the deal is.
So Oliver, I'm thinking about a younger patient who could tolerate a triplet. And walks in. You're going to see a case like that in a second from a Sandy. All of a sudden is dealing with metastatic prostate cancer, a shocking thing, about to go in ADT and more. And then the question is, on top of everything else, are you going to give that patient docetaxel? You know, based on what we just heard, the answer would be yes. But would you say to the patient, well, we really don't have clear-cut evidence that by adding docetaxel, it'll be better than giving intensified endocrine therapy. And how do you discuss this with your patients? Yeah, so it's a great question, Neil. And, and you know, one of the things that I, I think is a little bit complicated here is the history in the charted trial and in the stampede trial was to add the ADT docetaxel. And then the question was, could you have greater effect by putting in abiraterone, enzalutamide, whatever, darolutamide? It turns out that there's another question in my mind, and that is, what's the value of docetaxel? Now, Kareem makes really good points. You know, it's not a great therapy in the castrate resistant setting, and maybe you get more effect when you give it up front. But I think if we're strict about the way we look at the data, that we would say ADT and say abiraterone could be a standard, and the question is, what does docetaxel add? Now, that study has not been done. And so if we are conservative and a little bit strict in the way we interpret the data, we can ask, what's the value of docetaxel? And I think the honest answer is we don't really know. Now, the triplet is going to be better. If you're going to be using ADT docetaxel, I think adding in the darolutamide or abiraterone makes a lot of sense. I really do. But on the other hand, if you question the use of docetaxel, and you're going to be going with some ADT abiraterone, ADT enzalutamide, ADT apalutamide, darolutamide, you know, whichever, we don't actually have the data with darolutamide. But if we look at the intensification with the hormonal therapy, I think it's legitimate to ask, what does docetaxel add? Alicia? I mean, I, I, I want to look at the others, because, you know, so, sometimes I get a little bit fixed in my own mind, but I want to make sure about reality that's checks. That's why we're here, Alicia. Yeah. Yeah. Reality check, and, guys. And that's exactly why we're here, to you know, have these conversations. I think that the way that I think about docetaxel is that I'm going to use it now or I'm going to use it later in a patient who's going to be fit for docetaxel. And from my perspective, I want to give it when I know that there's clear evidence of that triplet activity, when the patient's younger and healthier probably than they'll be in a few years. Certainly they're younger than they're going to be in a few years. And if they're fit and they have the social support and they understand the side effect profile, I would rather do six cycles now than 10 cycles later. And that's, that's just generally how I think about it. But I ask the same question. I think we all ask these questions and it's just a matter from my perspective again of, of when. So let's uh, bring this uh, to a real case. Uh, Raina, I want you to listen to this case and uh, uh, tell me how you would discuss uh, the options with the patient. Here's Sandy. CEO of a startup company, through the pandemic, he had no health checkups. So he went in early part of this year to have a PSA done and was shocked that his PSA came back at 184. He literally told me the story how he walked out of that room totally devastated about what's happened. He then gets a biopsy that, no surprise, was a high Gleason score. He gets a PYL PSMA scan that shows disease in the prostate, but has also got disease in his inferior pubic rami, bilaterally, external nodes, and also has lesions in the lung. He's young, he is chemo fit, he has visceral disease, which is in the lung. So should he get a triplet? Should he get radiation to the prostate? And I do have a question about visceral mets. Are they all the same? So like is lung and liver similar prognostic, et cetera, et cetera. Raina? Yeah, no, I think these situations can be quite challenging. And first I would ask, I know this patient was diagnosed by a PYL PSMA PET, but I do want to see what their conventional imaging shows. I want to see that those you know, where those METs actually observed on that corresponding CT scan, did the patient have a bone scan that identified those lesions? Because I think our categoriz categorization schema that Kareem went through with us is based off of conventional imaging. And so, um, you know, you'd hate to put the, this patient in the category of high volume disease um, when, you know, they could potentially benefit from potential radiation to their prostate or some sort of local therapy. I think this is um, a patient that, you know, I would definitely discuss treatment intensification with 
uh, potentially triple therapy. I do think that the um, uh, dynamics of lung metastases can be quite different than the dynamics of liver metastases. I think we've seen that in clinical practice. And quite honestly, I think we've been talking about um, uh, clinical parameters to think about clinical decision making in the context of MHSPC, largely around timing and volume of metastases. But I think in the era of next generation sequencing, we're actually learning more about these tumors. We're learning more about the presence of, you know, uh, tumor suppressor loss, SPOP alterations, other things like that that could potentially inform um, treatment decision making. You know, we don't necessarily have prospective data, but I think just from the um, subset analyses from existing studies, I think that data can potentially be useful. But I think this is a potential, you know, individual who could benefit from treatment intensification. And I think the big question to ask is, are you ever, you know, we don't know the answer to this, but are you, are you able to make up the difference from an OS standpoint with sequential use of ta docetaxel than as opposed to giving it up front? Like if you give it up front, that benefit that you get in the MHSPC setting, are you going to be able to overcome that in the MCRPC setting? You know, so um, I think we don't know the answer to that, but in all of the strategies where we've intensified up front, you can't make up the delta in the MCRPC setting. Like the benefit is just so profound in the MHSPC setting. So, uh, Emmanuel, you know, this would see, seem to be almost the poster child for the perfect situation almost to consider a triplet. How would you discuss it with the patient? I mean, uh, let's assume the patient's educated. Maybe the patient's a medical oncologist. Uh, how would you discuss it? And how would you discuss the issue of docetaxel now versus not? You know, Neil, many of these patients may not have a positive CT scan for the pulmonary meth. So, or let's say it's positive. That's a caveat. But... If he's truly positive, uh, there's no question. I don't think anyone on this panel would disagree that liver mets are the, the bad prognosis, visceral mets and lung mets. Sometimes those patients can live forever. They're very hormone sensitive. There's been publications on that. The molecular profiles are different. They're more characterized by SPOP mutations, less P53, RB1 loss, etc. But yes, this technically counts as high volume disease, according to the charted definition. And the patient is young, we assume he's otherwise fit. And in the absence of pre-existing neuropathy, um, and uh, provided that the patient is, uh, is game for maximal therapy, I think the uh, addition of docetaxel would be appropriate here, and that could be done with ADT plus darolutamide plus docetaxel, or ADT plus abiraterone plus docetaxel. Uh, Kareem, would you like to weigh in on this case? How strongly would you feel, you know, putting aside whether a patient could go into a protocol, but if the patient said, you know, wow, I'm going to be dealing with ADT, my whole life is changing, can we hold off on the docetaxel, would you be okay with that, or would you really feel this is not a good idea, he ought to get a triplet? Oh, I, I, in, in such a situation, I, I, I would clearly recommend the triplet. And, and typically, you know, when, when patients are telling me where I don't like the idea of receiving chemotherapy, either in this situation or in another one, I tend to, to negotiate with the patient and say, give it a try. You will decide. Don't worry. I'm, I'm not going to run after you and catch you and, and, and inject the, the chemo. Just get a first cycle and we'll speak again in three weeks' time. If you don't like it, you don't like it, and we stop. And most patients, you know, actually tolerate it okay and, and carry on until, you know, four, five, six, six cycles. So um, this is typically the conversation I would have with, with, with someone who is really hesitant. All right, Reina, let's talk about some data. Great, wonderful. So we're going to dive into available and emerging strategies for um, NMCRPC. Um, kind of go through these objectives to talk about um, what's the, uh, you know, clinical decision making that you all think about, the disease factors, the patient factors that you think about for deciding on any given therapy. We'll talk about older drugs and uh, newer drugs that are emerging as well. So this is sort of the landscape of advanced prostate cancer. We've been talking a lot about the, what's been happening in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting, but there's of course a series of agents that are now utilized in the MHSP, or MCRPC setting from uh, taxane chemotherapy, the AR um, you know, uh, pathway inhibitors, cipulosal T, cabazitaxel, radium, and more recently, lutetium PSMA. And we've also got um, a biomarker uh, selected therapy with olaparib, rucaparib, and uh, pembrolizumab as well. 
Um, you know, I think the factors that impact uh, my treatment decision making in the metastatic CRPC setting include disease factors. We've talked a lot about, the, about these. I think it's ever more important, you know, what prior therapies have they received, particularly what have they received in the MHSBC setting? Are they coming into MCRPC being, you know, naive to ataxane, naive to an ARSI, or have they been exposed to one or the other or neither? Um, burden of disease, I think disease kinetics also matters, you know, do they have just PSA progression and they're coming into M1 CRPC based, P based off of PSA progression alone, or is it based off of radiographic pro progression, sites of METS, um, Gleason score, less relevant here, but genomic parameters. I think clinical factors also matters, is the patient symptomatic, what's their performance status, what are their comorbidities, what concurrent medications are they on, and then of course thinking about the drug factors, the mechanism of action of the agent that you're potentially thinking about, utilizing mode of administration administration and um, cost as well. Um, you know, with, when people develop CRPC, um, you know, there's multiple uh, different pathways of how, um, you know, patients, uh, you know, come into metastatic CRPC. They can have sort of continued AR-driven disease, and we've heard about that from Kareem um, earlier today, whether it be, um, you know, alternate ligands that are activating the re receptor, AR amplifications, AR mutations, um, that disease continues to be AR-driven, or is it ligand independent with um, upregulation of alternate pathways? And I really like sort of the breakdown in the NCCN guidelines. I know this uh, looks like a laundry list of agents, but I think we're moving away from sort of this one-size-fits-all model and actually taking into account what that patient may have received in the metastatic hormone-sensitive setting to really help guide what to potentially do in the um, M1 CRPC setting based off of whether they've received a prior taxane or a prior NHT, um, uh, whether they received one of those medications or uh, both of those medications. Um, so just going through a little bit regarding the prior available therapies, we'll talk about Cipulucil-T. This is an autologous um, dendritic cell vaccine. It's been around for a long time, since 2010. Um, you know, it demonstrated uh, superiority in a large phase three trial. I think some of the... Um, you know, uh, the question is, does it still have relevance in the modern era? Um, it does, it's not associated with PSA responses. It's not associated with objective responses. I think potentially where it has a role is uh, people who are asymptomatic, low volume disease, um, lack of visceral metastases, potentially developing M1 CRPC with PSA progression alone, and you're kind of dragging your feet regarding the need to um, put them on any given therapy. I think that's actually probably the sweet spot for utilization of this agent. Um, but, um, you know, when we look at data about how it's being used, in the modern day, probably less than 10% of patients are ever seeing uh, cipulucil T. Um, here are various uh, studies that have looked at cipulucil T. I think we need to take these studies for what, what they are. They're small, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, the first two are prospective trials, but, um, you know, they're not large randomized uh, uh, trials. Uh, Stride looked at concurrent versus sequential ARDA use. Uh, Stride looked at the use of enzalutamide, whether it be given uh, sequentially or concurrently. Um, STAMP looked at concurrent versus sequential abiraterone, and it seemed like uh, the concurrent strategy was associated with improved outcomes when given with uh, cipulucil T as opposed to the sequential strategy. Again, these are small numbers, small trials trials, kind of, um, you know, uh, thinking about how to potentially integrate um, uh, use of an ARSI uh, with uh, 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 cipulucil T. Uh, with regards to um, uh, combination therapy with radium-223, I think this is data actually from the Johns Hopkins group uh, that conducted a study looking at the combination of cipulucil T with or without the addition of radium-223, demonstrating a signal when the two are, are used um, concurrently. There's also some retrospective data about the concurrent and sequential use of ARDAs um, in the combination uh, with in combination with cipulucil T. Um, I think people that receive cipulucil T just from retrospective data seem to uh, do better even after correcting in multivariate analysis. I think we need to be careful about these kinds of data. There's a lot of bias around who would actually receive cipulucil T. These patients tend to be asymptomatic. They tend to, um, you know, uh, be associated with lower disease burden, lower uh, rates of symptomatic disease. But I think we do have some evolving data about the modern day use of cipulucil T um, in the current era. Um, here is a study that we actually uh, conducted, a phase uh, two multicenter study of enzalutamide in the castration resistant um, setting. I know this uh, uh, snuck in here, um, looking at, uh, you know, PSA responses based off of uh, prior therapy with enzalutamide in the MCRPC setting. Really, this trial was designed about understanding the genomics around um, enzalutamide utilization in the MCRPC setting. We did paired biopsies in the context of the study. I think it kind of snuck into the slide deck. It was kind of in the uh, appendix, but um, the, the 
biggest thing that we found was actually patients that had, um, you know, uh, this is a very messy slide here, but had TP53 alterations, that had uh, tumor suppressor loss, that had RB loss seemed to actually do worse. People that actually had AR alterations seemed to actually potentially do worse. SPOP alterations did better with the utilization of enzalutamide. So I think we're learning more about the utilization of these ARSIs um, in the context of um, MCRPC. I think a lot of these patients now um, may have potentially already received an ARSI for um, uh, metastatic castration resistant disease. All right, a little bit about the cell cycle. Um, I think we have to kind of go back to uh, biology here. So, um, you know, every cell, when it's undergoing the state of cell division, you know, it's usually sitting in um, cell cycle arrest in, G, in G0, but it, when it actually kind of decides to, to proliferate and, and grow, it enters into the cell cycle pathway, and you've got critical checkpoints, particularly between the transition from G1, which is the first growth phase, when you're getting into the S phase, which is where you're basically at that step where you're about to synthesize the DNA, there's very critical checkpoints that are at that level, um, including cyclin um, D, um, uh, CDK4 and 6, that regulate that transition going into S, finally G2, and actually cell proliferation. And there have been some drugs that have actually developed to intercede on the cell cycle pathway. Um, there's a lot of crosstalk between the cell cycle um, pathway and the AR pathway. We know that androgen receptors, like the estrogen receptors, are key regulators of cell cycle and are really instrumental in transcriptions of genes that allow that transition from G1 um, to S. And uh, preclinical studies have certainly demonstrated that inhibition um, with CDK4-6 actually triggers this G1 arrest in the cell cycle, and that there can actually be potential synergy in preclinical models with CDK4-6 inhibitors and AR signaling um, uh, pathway inhibitors. Um, there are several CDK4-6 inhibitors that are on, um, that are being um, tested or have been tested in uh, patients with advanced prostate cancer, abemocyclib, libocyclib, palbocyclib. Um, these agents are already FDA approved for the treatment of advanced um, breast cancer. Abemocyclib also has an indication in early breast cancer that's, her, that's HR positive, um, HER2 negative. Um, there are differences with these agents regarding their activity at CDK4-6. Abemocyclib is the most potent um, with, um, you know, a really low IC50s um, at CDK4-6 and also does have some activity at CDK9. So it's a little bit, has a little bit of a distinct mechanism of action compared to ribo and palbocyclib. And then as we think about sort of the, um, uh, you know, uh, pharmacology of these agents, um, abemocyclib is, uh, uh, you know, uh, has a little bit shorter half-life. It's given on a twice-daily basis, does have CNS penetration, and you can see the side effect profiles there. There's a little bit more uh, GI toxicity that's associated with abemocyclib, um, less myelosuppression than is seen with ribocyclib and palbocyclib. And so we'll highlight some data from the Cyclone 1 study. These were data that were presented at AACR uh, by Dr. Agarwal. Uh, this was a study that looked at abemocyclib in, as a, given as a monotherapy in a heavily pretreated uh, patient population. Um, these are sort of the top line data from this uh, trial. I think we need to keep in mind, again, that this was a pretty refractory patient population, but looking at the objective uh, response rate um, was at 6.8%. Not everybody was valuable for response in the context of this um, advanced study. The stable disease rate was at 40.9%, disease control rate right around 50%. I think very underwhelming uh, median rate of graphic progression free survival of 2.7 months, but this is, again, small study really being conducted in the refractory um, setting. Um, there are other studies that are looking at abemocyclib in this context. The Cyclin 2 trial is looking at abemocyclib in combination with abiraterone in the frontline MCRPC um, setting. This was a large phase 2, 3 study with a go, no go uh, signal after the phase 2 to potentially proceed into the phase 3, which it did. Uh, the trial is closed and we're awaiting the results of this trial. Um, and I think that is the key items to highlight. So let's go back uh, point. So I think the, really the main strategy here is that there's a lot of new drugs that are being developed um, in the metastatic CRPC setting, um, particularly the cyclin CDK4-6 pathway is being looked at pretty heavily um, in this context. Um, we're learning more about the use of uh, older drugs in the modern era and how to potentially integrate them in the MCRPC setting. So I can just hear the brains buzzing out there. The oncologists who are, I mean, we, we've been talking a lot about CDK and breast cancer. Monday, we'll be talking about that. So just a little bit about this, so fascinating. I, and still ringing in my head is Kareem's earlier comment about the fact that the androgen receptor remains intact late on. So really 
just because abiraterone doesn't work after enzalutamide, it doesn't mean that something else would. So Alicia, Dana-Farber really to me is the place I think about when I think about CDK inhibitors, your colleagues in breast cancer. I actually work with Sarah Tulaney, and we, we're, on Monday night we're showing some videos, and so Sarah's in one of the videos, and one of the things I was asking her, one, you pointed out the differences in the, in, the, in the three agents used in breast cancer, and incidentally, we all know that Abema now has moved up into the adjuvant setting, or FDA approved, but at this meeting, Ribo is being presented in the adjuvant setting. One big difference, I don't know if you noticed, on the, certainly oncologists know this, Abema is given continuously, the other two are intermittently, whether that's an advantage or not, but also the uh, tolerability of course, this is given with hormonal therapy, but you know, diarrhea was something that came out with Abema. Sarah and her group were one of the people who really uh, first uh, saw that. Uh, in the video, and interestingly, that we're gonna show Monday, I asked Sarah, like, what's the likelihood that you can get somebody through two years of Abema? And she said in the trial, 27% of people dropped out because of diarrhea, but nowadays they know what to do, they know how to dose reduce, they prep these patients and they rarely drop out. Uh, Sarah Hervitz from UCLA also was commenting on sort of, the, sort of the refineties of how they look at this. It's not just the number of times per day that uh, people have diarrhea, but whether or not it comes on unexpectedly, you know, uh, during their Pilates class, et cetera. Any thoughts uh, about, I'm sure you've been seeing all this happen in, in breast cancer, how this might play out in prostate cancer, Alicia? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, we, we actually uh, investigated palbociclib a number of years ago in hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. Um, and I think, Emmanuel, you may have been involved in that study. Maha Hussein was involved with that. And uh, Karen Knudsen actually came up with a lot of the sort of background preliminary data there. And I put some patients on that trial as well. And it was actually well tolerated. There was a, there was a small amount of pneumonitis on that study, um, some neutropenia, but well tolerated. And it was so disappointing that it was negative, uh, unfortunately, so disappointing. And that was, uh, you know, again, several years ago. I think now I'm, I'm much more excited about the data I'm seeing with the Cyclone program. And I know Raina has a study, I think, in the, in the MHSPC population, where I think that the combination maybe with these AR targeted agents is going to give us a better opportunity to have some activity with this agent. And the other thing I would say is that tolerability is always the name of the game when it comes to actually getting medications into patients. They don't work when they sit on the shelves. And I think that our interest in supportive care in GU oncology is really um, so intense. And I'm, I'm certain that we can get people through things. And I, I so appreciate, too, that our colleagues in breast cancer are working through some of these, these uh, issues because we can take those learnings. And, and you, anyone who's a general oncologist already has those learnings and can already apply them. And we, as GU oncologists, hopefully we'll be able to learn them uh, too, from our, from our colleagues. Yeah, and we already know, you know, uh, uh, ribo and palbo, you see neutropenia, usually asymptomatic, so different whether it has to do with the, the schedule or not, or the drugs themselves, but clearly different toxicity. Any comments, Raina? No, I think the biggest thing is being super proactive um, and actually, uh, you know, doing a lot of education with the patients around the diarrhea. I think that's the biggest thing with the abemocyclib. I think in the context of metastatic hormone sensitive disease, it's even more critical to be proactive about it because patients can stay on therapy for a long time and be, you know, on therapy for years potentially. So I think, um, you know, prophylaxis is the name of the game, close monitoring engagement with your nursing staff and other staff is going to be really important. I think there's a lot of uh, newer targeted therapies that are being looked at and evaluated in, in the prostate cancer that are going to be really important. You know, CAP, uh, CAPI in the MHSPC setting as well, I think is uh, important. Right. I saw that on the slide. CAPI research of an AKT inhibitor, phase three trial just presented, San Antonio positive. People are thinking it's going to be proof. Another hormonal agent. They have these SIRDs. We'll talk about uh, maybe uh, what they call Protax, and we'll talk about that uh, later, uh, but uh, it will be really interesting to see how this plays out. Also interesting, they started out, I didn't realize, looking at Abema alone, because actually Abema is the only one that saw activity without endocrine therapy in breast cancer, although now people don't use that very much, but they did see activity. But you, really, it's combined with hormonal therapy for sure. So, well, now we get to the really good stuff. No, just kidding, but here we go, PARP inhibitors. So uh, another incredible advance uh, that's happened in uh, prostate cancer. Of course, we all just saw uh, the approval uh, of the Propel uh, situation with Olaparib. We're going to get into that in a second because we have a patient like that. But uh, I'll ask uh, Emmanuel what he thinks about uh, this case from Niraj. He continues to receive Olaparib to date, almost three years now. 
Any tolerability issues? He did experience nausea and vomiting initially after starting Olaparib. But without reducing the dose, we were able to manage those symptoms with anti-emetic medications, mostly composine and occasional lorazepam on a PRN basis. Both if the medications were very effective and allowed us to continue Olaparib at the full dose. He did develop anemia, but his anemia has not become severe and he continues to tolerate Olaparib with a hemoglobin level of approximately 12 gram percent. He continues to have stable disease on imaging and PSA continues to respond. His PSA is actually quite low. It remains below two nanogram per mil, even now. Any questions you'd like to hear them discuss? Fortunately, we had tissue available in-house and we were able to test the patient. It is not uncommon for local laboratories to discard the tissue after 10 years. Do you favor obtaining comprehensive genomic profiling at the first diagnosis of metastatic or non-metastatic castration-sensitive prostate cancer and not wait until the onset of metastatic CRPC? So a thought, I never even thought about that, Emmanuel. I should have mentioned this patient had castrate resistant disease and a somatic BRCA2 mutation. And as you can hear, has been on a lap for three years. Any thoughts and also maybe reflect a little bit on some of the tolerability issues he talked about? Yeah, so um, we know that BRCA2 is the most sensitive mutation to these uh, agents. I also discussed this case with uh, Niraj. Oh, really? He told me that the patient has a homozygous BRCA2 deletion. Huh. That means that he has complete genomic and protein loss of BRCA2. And these patients anecdotally have very long responses because they have no BRCA2 protein whatsoever. It's not just mutated, it's just entirely gone. And these patients can have profound responses lasting three years like this case. So that, that's just a little pearl. Do you see that on like the NGS or germline report? You can, it's not that common. It's about 5% of the BRCA2 mutations. And what, what does it say? Like, It just says homozygous loss or it says homozygous deletion. Homo all right. Um, in, in terms of the side effects, I think the nausea is the thing that we hear about the most from our patients. There's a few tricks there. You know, the antiemetic often does work, as he did here. Another trick is taking the medication with food. I found that if you take it with a snack or some food, the nausea is actually less uh, severe. Um, and of course, um, over time, the, the cytopenias can be a problem. It's about a 15% grade three anemia with this agent, and there's patients that do require blood transfusions. It's not common, but it happens. Um, and of course, we shouldn't forget that we can reduce the dose. So you can start with the 300 BID of the Olaparib, you can go down to 250 BID or 200 BID. So we'll talk a little bit more about tolerability issues, but I wanna bring in another case and see what Kareem thinks about it. And as I said, you know, we just saw the FDA approval of the sort of, I guess you'd call it the Propel strategy. There are a couple other trials in, uh, out there, we'll, and we'll see whether Niraparib uh, uh, gets approved also, or Telazoparib. Uh, but I'm curious, sort of putting aside uh, regulatory issues, because I'm not exactly sure what the situation uh, there is in the EU, but I'm curious uh, what you think about this case. Here's Dr. Mars. 72-year-old man, he did have a good NADA response on his ADT and radiation down to 0.1, and then a year later, unfortunately, was rising to 11, and his testosterone was still castrate. So he was still during that induction period. He just did not have a very long period of response to that two years of ADT induction. He had somatic testing with a BRCA2 mutation. He had new imaging, the bone scan with no uptake, a CT with a retroperitoneal node. And so he has not been on any additional therapy at this stage, but has a BRCA2 mutation and is currently CRPC because his PSA is rising while he's on his initial two years of ADT. So the patient had not gotten any AR intensification on the front end. So he certainly fits as a patient who would have been considered for many of the trials that have been presented on PARP inhibitor combinations. For BRCA2, it looks very clearly positive that if you have this sort of patient, it's an ideal person that they should start therapy with a PARP inhibitor combination if you're planning on using an AR agent. So I'm just kind of getting warmed up for tomorrow morning with ovarian cancer. We're going to get deep into uh, all the different mutations, somatic versus germline. But 
Kareem, any thoughts about this case? What would you like to be able to do? And if this patient didn't have a BRCA2, they were BRCA wild type, would you, if you could, use a lap room? So I'll start with, with the case itself. You know, um, understanding he has a BRCA2 alteration, a, a mutation, if, if, I'm, if I'm not wrong. Right. Um, so I, I think it would be really a good candidate for an early um, PARP inhibitor, early meaning right now, uh, combined with uh, an AR PARP inhibitor. He has obviously castration-resistant disease right now. This was confirmed by, by Dr. Morris. Uh, we saw uh, data from three randomized trials for, for this man in the last year or so, uh, magnitude, Propel, and, and then Telepro 2. And for patients with BRCA alterations, I think the, the data are crystal clear. The benefit is really enormous. Um, I have a privilege to show you tomorrow the, the, the data for Telepro 2 in the second cohort of men with um, DNA repair defects, including BRCA 2 but uh, I'm not going to comment too much about that tonight, but, but really uh, regarding the, what's, what's already in the public domain, those are really the men who, who benefit fra, from a combination of a PARP inhibitor and, a, and an AR PARP inhibitor. So I think that that would be clearly my, my recommendation to, to this man. Now, for, for your other option, with no bracket to alteration, uh, much more difficult because obviously that's not a good cancer at all. It's progressing quite rapidly from localized disease to CRPC, basically in, within two, three years. So that's not good at all. Um, I would still give it a try probably to an AR pathway inhibitor, um, but also understanding that it may not have a very hormone sensitive disease and that chemotherapy might need to to be considered soon, and or a, um, a treatment such as a PSMA targeting treatment. Um, but that would be a, actually a much more difficult situation, to be honest. So Alicia, when we talk to your colleagues, doctors Matt Alonis and Lou, one of the most controversial things in ovarian cancer is the patient who is BRCA wild type, LOH negative. There are data actually with niraparib, interestingly enough, and it's actually approved in that situation not, not nearly as much benefit, a lot of controversy. We actually did a satellite the day Propel was presented and Fred Saad was on our panel and he, was, he said, okay, we're giving it, I wanna give it to everybody, just like in the trial, because we, we saw a benefit, but yet the FDA decided it was just gonna be BRCA. Any thoughts about what you'd like to do in a patient who's wild type, Alicia? Sure, I, I, um, I actually think that there may be for some patients either uncharacterized alterations that were in the wild type group in these studies and, and perhaps had some responses or there may be some synergistic activity. I, I do think that may be possible. I, the reason I think this is because of study eight, Propel and now Talipro 2 all having this sort of consistent message. I do think that I'd love to see more, I'd like to see more data from Talipro 2. There was an uncharacterized population that still has not been characterized and I want to understand if part of that population may have BRCA2 and may be driving some of the signal there. But I think from my perspective as a clinician, um, I would like to have the opportunity to have a shared decision with a patient so that they, if they are young, if they're healthy, if they want to be more ag aggressive, may be able to make some of those decisions with me as the clinician um, rather than having a restricted label. And, and in Europe, you know, the, the, the label is different, which is, which is so interesting and re the reverse of what we often see where they, they actually have the opportunity. I'm not sure if in France, but in Europe in general, it seems like you may have the opportunity to use this as, in an unrestricted way regardless of HRR, right, Kareem? You know, it's correct. Uh, surprisingly, VMA provide a, a, an approval for the all-camer uh, population in, in for, for, for Propel, uh, which, which is unusual, to be honest. Um, now, in Europe, you know, the approval doesn't mean everything. We because we we are we have a social medicine, so we need a, a reimbursement to be able to to use a given treatment. And, and at the end of the day, this will be the reimbursement equation which will decide wh whether we will use that or not for patients in the all-camera situation. But I, I, I can have agree with you, generally speaking, regarding uh, of, um, I mean, regardless of uh, approval and reimbursement. I, I think 
For BRCA patients, really the, the, the data are crystal clear. For other patients, I think we, we, we just need more data. In, in Propel, overall survival was not improved. Uh, quality of life was not improved also. Uh, so it's, it's mostly an image which is getting better. Our PFS is, at the end of the day, just a, an image. Are we truly providing good care or improvement to all the patients? I'm not sure, because uh, there is also toxicity from PARP inhibition combined with uh, AER PARP inhibitors. Anemia is uh, uh, very often there, and it's great three or four in like 30, 40 percent of patients, which means transfusion for most of these patients on top of fatigue and everything. So I think we need to be very cautious, at least with the available data, for, for patients without uh, uh, DNA repair uh, alterations. You know, in a strange way, it kind of reminds me of a discussion we were here yesterday about upper GI cancer, first-line metastatic disease, where the FDA approved regardless of PD-1 level, and the investigator said, oh, we don't treat less than five because when you split it out, they don't benefit, and yet a lot of people in practical use it because the FDA approved it. They'll sit down with the patient and say, look, I'm not really sure. But the point is, they, they gave the patient and the doc the opportunity to make a decision. And actually, Dr. Morris actually said the same exact thing you did, Alicia. I wish we could have, you know, I wish they would have allowed us to do it. All right, Emmanuel, let's take it. Emmanuel was the one who pointed out to me a long time ago that actually it shouldn't have been called BRCA. It should have been called PARACA. <laughs> All right, this is going to be like a speed dating. Yeah, one. right. Okay. <laughs> All right, homologous recombination repair mutations, what are they? What are the genes? And who should we test? So this is the Antonarakis list. This is not published. I would never dare to do that. So my first here, the true homologous recombination genes are those on the left, BRCA2, BRCA1, PALB2, and then two rare ones. And then on the right side, the third tier, ATM, CDK12, we used to think of these as HRR genes. They probably don't function like that. So don't have very high hopes when you use a PARP inhibitor in those patients. If you add them all up, in metastatic castration-resistant biopsies, you're going to have about a 25% chance of having one or more of those. If you look at the germline, the inherited DNA of those patients with metastatic disease, about one in eight patients, or 12%, are going to have one of them, and the most common, as you can see on the pie chart, is BRCA2. So who should we test? The NCCN recommends germline testing and somatic testing separately. For germline testing, it's anyone with localized high risk or very high risk disease and anyone with metastatic disease. So that's the easy one. And then for somatic testing, there's really no clinical indication outside of the M1 metastatic disease. So for somatic testing, it's only those patients that have metastatic disease, not the high-risk localized yet. Now, let's review some of the clinical data, first for the monotherapy and then for the um, combinations. Uh, one slide about the rationale. And the rationale is this term that we're all familiar with now. We never knew what it meant in 2005 when it first came out, synthetic lethality. Sounds like a movie title. Um, Maybe Bruce Willis should be playing in that movie. But you need to wipe out both single-strand DNA repair and double-strand DNA repair to cause cell death. And these patients that have BRCA mutations, their double-strand repair is crippled, and now you're also crippling single-strand repair by blocking PARP. There are four PARP inhibitors that we have tested in prostate cancer, and these are very similar to other cancer types. They have differences in terms of their enzymatic PARP1 inhibition. And then there's this other component called PARP trapping. It turns out if you can PARP the trap enzyme on the DNA during the DNA replication phase, you can get what's called a replication fork collapse, where that cell is not able to replicate its DNA and therefore can die. And the most potent PARP trapper, you can see with the four pluses there at the bottom, is telazoprib. Now, this is going to be in your slide set, and I'm not going to go through it, but the monotherapy studies have shown about a 30% to 40% response rate in the HRR patients, again, mainly due to the BRCA2 patients. I'm going to go through the two pivotal trials in a bit more detail. Uh, the profound trial was the randomized study of Olaparib versus the alternative androgen receptor targeting therapy. This had a population of CRPC patients. They had to have received at least one uh, AR targeting therapy, and they could have received the taxane, but the taxane was not mandatory. Uh, 
Then they were randomized uh, into Olaparib, 300 milligrams BID, or the alternative AR targeting agent. Cohort A was BRCA1, BRCA2, or ATM patients. Cohort B was uh, 12 other genes. And the statistical design of this trial was an RPFS, whereby if the cohort A was positive, the study had the statistical power and the permission to combine cohort B plus cohort A, and then reanalyze PFS in that entire patient population. And when they did that, uh, because cohort A was in fact positive for PFS, the sum of cohorts A plus B, encompassing 14 different genes, was positive for RPFS and also had a very strong trend for overall survival. And the FDA said, this is good enough for us to approve Olaparib as a monotherapy after Abby or Enza for all 14 of those genes. However, if you look at the supplements of these papers, and this data was in the paper, it was just hidden away, you can see that it's the BRCA2 patients that have the greatest difference between Olaparib and control, whereas many of the other genes have relatively equivalent efficacy of the PARP inhibitor versus the control group. And in May 2020, which is now three years ago, uh, Olaparib was approved uh, with any of those 14 genes shown across the bottom, including BRCA1 and BRCA2 plus 12 others. The Triton 2 and 3 program, we're focusing on an alternative PARP inhibitor, Rucaparib. The Triton 2 program was a single arm, uncontrolled study, whereby about 100 patients with BRCA1, BRCA2, and some other mutations were given uh, Rucaparib as a monotherapy uh, in the post uh, AR and post-taxane uh, situation, so a third-line MCRPC setting. And this was the first time in the history of prostate cancer that the FDA granted an accelerated approval based on objective response rate in soft tissue disease in a non-randomized, uncontrolled study. And the approval was limited to BRCA1 and BRCA2, so that was a difference between Olaparib and Rucaparib. And the second difference was in these patients, they also had to have failed, not just an AR targeting therapy, but also a taxane, so really a third-line population. And of course, they mandated the randomized phase three study, which was done, and that was Triton three. And this was an interesting trial whereby this was MCRPC pre-chemotherapy, and the control group here could include either Abby or Anza or docetaxel. And that's very important because this is the first time we have docetaxel in the control arm for randomized phase three study. And they snuck in ATM as a third mutation. So remember, the approval so far was for BRCA1, BRCA2, they added ATM. And the overall RPFS was positive, showing that Rucaparib improved radiographic progression-free survival relative to either Abienza or Docetaxel. But the most interesting thing about this trial was actually the subsets. And you can start on the right-hand side, ATM group, truly no difference whatsoever in the, uh, so in other words, Rucaparib did not beat the control arm in that setting, but in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 subset, the difference was very, very clear. Now, this has not yet led to a full uh, or expanded approval of Rucaparib as a monotherapy. It might, but the question um, that remains is, will the ATM be added to the label, or will it, will it remain as BRCA1 and 2? I, I have my suspicions. I think it'll be BRCA1 and 2 alone. And then this brings us to the uh, three combination trials, Propel Magnitude and Telopro 2. There was recently an editorial in the European Urology called Propel Magnitude and Telopro Blues, because it's getting so complicated even for the experts. Propel was an all-comer study, abiraterone olaparib versus abiraterone. And then there was a post hoc analysis of the biomarker subsets. So the primary endpoint here, as we've been discussing, was the overall population, RPFS, and the RPFS was met with superiority of Olaparib plus abiraterone over abiraterone. If you look at the forest plot at the bottom, uh, the HRR positive group had an even greater improvement in uh, RPFS and the BRCA1-2 subset, which is not shown there, had an even more profound effect. Magnitude had two populations, HRR biomarker positive and biomarker negative. 
uh, unlike the previous study, the biomarker negative group here was negative. So they had an interim analysis, was stopped for futility. But in the biomarker positive group, there was an improvement in RPFS, both in the overall HRR population with niraparib in this case, plus abiraterone versus abiraterone alone. And the difference was even more uh, magnificent, no pun intended, in the BRCA1-2 uh, mutated group. And then the tiebreaker, so to speak, uh, I will not be talking about the unpublished data that Karim will present tomorrow morning, so please go to his presentation to see it. But um, in the cohort one, which was the all-comers cohort, um, again, similar to the uh, Propel study whereby patients were allowed to enroll, and then they were prospectively tested for the biomarker, but here we were reporting the biomarker positive and negative groups. In the overall patient population, Kaplan-Meier curve on the left, there was a statistically significant and clinically meaningful improvement with the addition of telezoperib to enzalutamide above enzalutamide alone. And when you look at the HRR positive and negative groups, the HRR mutated group, which is also called deficient, is on the top. You can see that the Kaplan-Meier curve split to a greater degree. But even in the HRR non-mutated or unknown group, that difference that you can see on the bottom right was also statistically significant. Now, on April 28th, the Oncology Advisory Committee, ODAC, was convened by the FDA, and maybe a surprise to some of us, or at least me, there was an 11 to 1 vote against the approval of this for the unselected population, that is, Olaparib abiraterone. And in the history of the FDA, whenever they've convened an ODAC, I think with only one exception, they've listened to the ODAC's advice. And when I was getting on the airplane to come to Chicago, this press release came out. And as we may all know by now, it, or perhaps you haven't seen it yet, the Propel study, so abiraterone plus Olaparib in first-line MCRPC, the label will be restricted to BRCA1 and BRCA2, germline or somatic, but just those two genes. So in conclusion, germline and somatic alterations are common, uh, more common in MCRPC than in localized disease. In terms of the monotherapy, we do have an FDA approval already for Olaparib for HRR mutated patients, 14 genes, as long as the patient has failed one AR targeting therapy. Rucaparib also has a monotherapy approval, Right now at the moment, it's for BRCA1 and BRCA2 alone, and it's a third-line MCRPC post-taxane. We've talked about propelled magnitude in Telepro, and I had to add that um, fifth bullet point on the airplane. We do now have an FDA approval for Abby and Olaparib, but only for BRCA1 and BRCA2, and we'll see if that becomes a precedent for the other study, including Telepro. So uh, to be continued, we, again, we could spend a couple hours just talking about PARP inhibitors, but just one more question back to you, Emmanuel. If you think about a patient, let's say, who has a BRCA2 germline mutation, and imagine that you're looking at a patient who's going to die of prostate cancer, uh, when do you think ideal, ideally, based on what we know right now, is the kind of the right, the optimal time to integrate a PARP inhibitor? Because to me, it seems like it would at least be hormone-sensitive metastatic, but you tell me. I have a suspicion that at the first sight of hormone-sensitive metastatic uh, prostate cancer, if you know you have a germline or somatic BRCA2, I suspect, although we don't have data yet, that that will be the place to use it. At the moment, we have to restrict that use to the first-line MCRPC, but there are two uh, phase three studies I'm going to answer that. Do you think, and I know at one time you were doing sort of a pilot study, an M0 disease without hormone therapy. Any thoughts about bringing it down even earlier? We did a 50-patient study with um, biochemical recurrence, um, rising PSA alone, um, with Olaparib uh, in the absence of ADT. And uh, we had 11 BRCA2 patients in that trial. Every single one responded, so 100% response rate. And uh, to date, with about three years of median follow-up, we've only had about two of the 11 that have recurred. Fascinating. Was that published? Okay. It's presented at this meeting uh, this morning. Really? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Final topic. Uh, we're going to get into uh, radio ligands. And uh, Raina, I'd like you to uh, listen to this case and uh, give me your thoughts. This is a patient of Dr. Agarwal. Patients chose PSMA expression in the tumors. Patient asked for lutetium therapy, and we don't have lutetium available. So what are the options, alternative options? How do you think of cabazitaxel in this setting? 
based on the data from therapy trial and the vision trial combined together. What is the role of cabazitaxel in this setting when patient has received eight cycles of docetaxel chemotherapy? There is a high level of PSMA expression on the gallium PSMA scan. Is this bone only disease? This is bone only disease. That's a good point. Yes. How do you sequence lutetium after radium or radium after lutetium? So, you know, we've talked a lot this weekend already, and we're going to be talking a lot more the next couple of days about chemotherapy shortage, Reina. What's the current situation in terms of lutetium, and what are you doing in situations when you can't access it in a situation like this? Here, you do have the alternative of radium because this patient has bone only mets. But what's going on right now? Are you able to get lutetium right now? I think actually we finally um, potentially overcome the manufacturing issues. I think a new plant has been um, established and I think we're, it's becoming more readily available for utilization in the, in the clinic. So I think hopefully we're beginning to see those supply issues, you know, not really become a huge um, factor. You know, we don't necessarily, when looking at the therapy trial, you know, the therapy trial was a very specific study that looked at both the dual um, you know, selection factor of having PSMA positive disease and you know, lack of discordant disease with FDG PET imaging. Patients were randomized to receive cabazitaxel versus receiving uh, lutetium. And the study's primary endpoint was looking at PSA response and demonstrated a significant PSA response with a PSMA targeted therapy, as you would expect. There was no difference with regards to overall survival, though really the study was a small study and wasn't really powered to look at overall survival. So I think we have to interpret that data with confidence. You know, I think at the present time, we don't necessarily have data to say that um, you should use cabazitaxel over um, lutetium, you know, in this context, I think both could potentially be utilized. I think the struggles with radium-223 are that there's really no activity outside of the bone, there's no PSA response, there's no objective response, there's no actual way to tell that that therapy is working for that given patient with the um, outs with with the caveat that it does seem to improve, improve symptomatic bony disease and actually improve pain and improve, you know, the risk of skeletal related events. So we don't necessarily know, you know, what's the right sequencing strategy. I think this gentleman um, could be an excellent candidate for cabazitaxel, um, you know, could also be a good candidate for a lutetium-223. I think what we're gonna, or uh, lutetium-617, um, I think what we're gonna run into is issues with malotoxicity and malosuppression when we start using, you know, sequential chemotherapy, sequential radioligand therapy in this context. So just to clarify that, of course, I'm going to ask Oliver also uh, the issue of patients who do have bone-only mets. It sounds like you're maybe favoring lutetium, but do you take into consideration the degree of PSMA expression? Absolutely. I think that is, I mean, we even saw, you know, earlier today that that does seem to be potentially a biomarker um, regarding response to uh, lutetium. So, um, you know, at the present time, we don't necessarily have uh, the right thresholds. We don't know what, you know, we can't, you know, Oliver can probably speak to this more. Uh, you know, we're not getting SUV means, SUV maxes don't really seem to be as predictive of response. Um, but I think, you know, what does matter is, um, you know, making sure that patients don't have like, let's say, discordant disease, but lack of PSMA positive lesions, like liver metastases and so forth. So I've always admired uh, Oliver's uh, passion for radiopharmaceuticals. Now you're the director of Radiopharmaceuticals Clinical Trials. I'm not sure how many other people have that kind of a title, but I think it tells you how important this is to you. Let's talk about some of the data. Also, maybe before you even begin, can you answer this question of what comes first, radium or lutetium? You know, I think the lutetium is kind of taken over right now. You have the PSMA PET positive biomarker. That's really important. I think you have a lot to show that lutetium is working. You have objective responses. You have PSA declines. You have RPFS. You have OS. So you get a totality of evidence, I think, with the PSMA lutetium now that is a little bit different than the radium where you, you did have the survival. But I'm going to mention this, Neil. The radium was in an older context. It was not in the Avienza era. There was a lot of differences between the patients that were treated in that 2013 trial and the current trials where we have so much more treatments available as opposed to then. Would you use radium after lutetium? You know, I actually have not. So I don't know if others have, but uh, you know, we've used radium before lutetium and we actually have a study called the Rollo study that we published on that. But on the other hand, I don't have much experience on radio. I have no experience of radium after lutetium. All right, let's take a look at some data. 
Yeah, so um, thanks again for the opportunity to be here. And I was asked to kind of cover some of the radium, cabazitaxel, and PISMA, lutetium. And I, I think it's a little bit of an interesting era that we're in now because we've had thematically tonight the story about the hormones coming earlier and earlier. And there's really no doubt in my mind that the early use of hormones makes a tremendous difference. And we have study after study after study to show that's the case. But the implications are that the castrate resistant disease that we see today is very different than what we saw yesterday. And furthermore, we have the triplet therapies that are changing it yet again. So, so much is different about CRPC today than what we used to call CRPC. And yes, I can go through all the different sort of algorithms and talk about pre and post docetaxel. Uh, I think these are well known, so I don't need to cover it a lot. Um, I'm going to be covering three agents here. I'll talk about radium, cabastaxel, and the pismelotitium. Uh, the radium is an alpha emitter, uh, the first alpha emitter in medicine, which I think is important. We're going to hear a lot more about alpha emitters. It's just going to be targeted alpha therapy that's coming down the pike. The alpha emitter radium will bind to bone stroma, actually binds to hydroxyapatite, does not actually target the tumor itself, but it targets the areas of active bone turnover, the blastic lesions, if you will. Cabazitaxel is a, a taxane, binds to tubulin, inhibits microtubular function, and the PSMA lutetium will bind to PSMA expressed on the cell surface of the tumor cell. And that's important because we now have tumor-targeted therapy, and of course it makes a difference. Now, if we go back to what we're going to call the Alsimca trial, that was the original phase three with radium. And Again, I think a very important trial because it showed that the radiopharmaceuticals could prolong survival. A bone targeted therapy could prolong survival in selected patients. But I think we have to look at it again in the context and kind of the lens that we use today. So that trial was performed in patients who had <coughs> failed ADT monotherapy or ADT docetaxel. There was no utilization of the apalutamides, enzalutamides, abiraterones that we commonly use today. The population, the biomarker, if you will, was bone scan positivity and symptomatic and excluded the visceral mats. You certainly don't want to be treating a patient with radium if they've got liver mats or big bulky lymph nodes. That's probably not the right patient for radium. The control arm was standard of care and excluded the chemotherapy, but standard of care then was more about dexamethasone, bicolitamide than it was abiraterone, enzalutamide type things. The overall survival was unequivocally positive, which is while it was FDA approved, while it was a New England Journal article. But, you know, I, I think that we have to look at the limitations. You know, radium only goes to bone stroma. It's not going to be going elsewhere. It unequivocally moved the field forward, but now we have a very different landscape. And so when I look back at that 2013 study, what I'm going to say is I'd really like some new trials that are going to demonstrate efficacy in this sort of modern era. Now, there is a trial called the PEACE-3 trial, and Silky Gillis and others have presented parts of that in a preliminary way. We don't actually have the results. And I'll simply say that I look forward to PEACE-3, and that'll be a combination of enzalutamide plus or minus radium. I think that's an important trial. Now, cabazitaxel, I did not present here the original TROPIC trial published in 2010, but the important thing about cabazitaxel is it does work, and we have multiple trials that have shown to be positive. This is the CARD trial. Uh, thank you, Kareem, for helping educate me a little bit earlier. It's mainly a French trial. I think it's more Dutch. But turns out this important European trial looked at cabazitaxel versus avienza in patients who'd already received docetaxel and abiraterone enzalutamide. And this patient population was kind of all comers, if you will. There are a few exclusions I'm not going to get into because I don't think they're that important. But the bottom line is the primary endpoint, which was RPFS, was unequivocally positive. The overall survival was unequivocally positive. And this is sort of a modern era, if you will, of the abiraterone, enzalutamide, pretreated patients with an abianza control, cabazitaxel, showing positivity. That's important. Now, there are a couple of other trials. One I'll point out on the top. There's one called the Cabasti trial, and this one utilizes a Q2-week, uh, not dostaxel, Cabastaxel, 
and compares it to the Q3 week, and it turns out you pretty much have the same efficacy, but less in the way of neutropenic operation. I think for elderly patients, it might be an option. Um, the ostrich trial, I don't think is that relevant. The CURD trial is better. If we look sort of at a summary statement of capacity tax, I think it's an important step forward. And we've known this since 2010, when in the post taxal space, we had the tropic trial show prolongation, got the FDA approval. I think the limitation is, you know, in the U.S., only about 50% of patients with metastatic CRPC are actually treated with chemotherapy. And that's true, by the way, when we go to Europe as well. A lot of patients never, ever receive any chemotherapy, and cabazitaxel is a second-line chemotherapy. So we did another trial that was called Firstana to look at the comparability of cabazitaxel and docetaxel. It turns out cabazitaxel looked pretty much the same, a little different spectrum of toxicity, but it's not FDA approved in that setting. Now, one of the things that I think has been a game changer is the PSMA lutetium, this is also a New England Journal paper. And this is in the modern era, if you will. We had ADT, we had abiraterone and zalutamide pretreatments, we had docetaxel pretreatments, cabazitaxel pretreatment in 41% of the cases. This was a really, really, really heavily pretreated patient population. The biomarker, if you will, was PSMA PET selectivity. So everybody got a PSMA PET, and you had to have metastatic disease with the PSMA PET uptake greater than the liver in order to get on the trial. Now, interestingly, that was 87% of the patients, a little bit higher than what I was thinking. The control arm was a standard of care, and a standard of care plus or minus the, the lutetium, excluding chemotherapy because we didn't have any safety data with the chemotherapy. But you know, remember, all the patients had prior dose taxol, and 40% of the patients had the, both cabazitaxel and docetaxel, very, very heavily pretreated. There was an overall survival benefit. Hazard ratio was 0.62 on the OS. RPFS was 0.40. Unequivocally positive, FDA approved. And that's really important. One of the things that's interesting is the PSA declines at about 12 weeks were actually associated strongly with survival. If you look at this particular slide, you can see that those patients who had a good PSA decline actually went on were living a long time, where those patients who had a less good PSA decline or PSA rise only, not so good. So PSA remains a pretty viable biomarker, even in this far advanced setting. I was a little bit surprised to me. I don't think it would turn out that good. One of the things that was mentioned earlier, and I think this is very important, there was an Australian trial called Therapy, and in this case, there was a comparison of the PSMA lutetium versus cabazitaxel. Now, it was a randomized phase two. It was not done as a non-inferiority. It's not done as really, a, it was done as superiority with PSA as an endpoint. But this was reported by Michael Hoffman and colleagues. The hazard ratio of overall survival in this PSMA pet selected patients was pretty much exactly the same. Hazard ratio 0 0.97 on OS. Now, the quality of life was better with the PSMA lutetium, but Nevertheless, I think the survival was surprising to the Australians about how good it was with the cabazitaxel. We have some important new trials. One called the PSMA-4 is a pre-chemotherapy metastatic CRPC trial. So patients who would have not have received docetaxel would have received abirenzib. And this trial is positive. It was announced positive December the 5th. The SPLASH trial is another one using a different PSMA binding ligand called PSMA INT instead of PSMA 617, it's completed accrual. So we're going to get some interesting data coming up over the next year in these two steps. Now, the PSMA lutetium was a really important step forward. The supply chain was incredibly problematic. It's now easing. It's now better, much better today than it was even four weeks ago. So the supply chains are being worked on and they're being solved. And I think that this is an important new therapy. I think the vision trial established the importance of PSMA 6 and 7. I think the PSMA 4 trial is going to move it earlier. And we're going to look at the splash trial as well. So it's a lot of interesting data we're going to have accessible. One thing that has struck me, and I just I threw this kind of as a last slide, if you will. I think we continue to miss important elements to the biology of metastatic CRPC. We have these adenocarcinomas, uh, error-driven, and they're really important. 
I think they're about half the patients. You know, we, we get through Avienza, but nevertheless, you have more to the story. Now, neuroendocrine we've talked about for a long time, but it turns out neuroendocrine is only a minority. There are other things out there. This particular paper w wanted to call a stem cell driven component and also another component being driven by the WENT pathway. So I don't think we're targeting all the heterogeneous disease that we need to target. And I'm just going to say, I'm going to be working on trying to solve some of these other populations of cells that we're not hitting very well right now. And by the way, I really enjoy the PSMA lutetium. It's not perfect. We can do better. So let's keep working. So, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of ESR1 in breast cancer. We're going to talk about that Monday night. There's mutations in the estrogen receptor. You see that in androgen receptors? Like oh, mutations yeah. in it? Oh, oh, absolutely. I actually had a poster this morning where we looked at the androgen receptor mutations. There's some that are pretty common. One called the 875, 878 mutations are pretty common. And they're potentially targetable with things like AR degraders. And there's also some data, and cream has been very influential here looking at a, a molecule, uh, one of the ODM series, I forget what, what number it is, but nevertheless, uh, Kareem and colleagues have shown that the androgen receptor mutations, like and binding receptor mutations, can be sensitive to a variety of new ways to approach that disease. I like the name of the splash trial. It has a little bit of yeah, bit that's of zip a little splashy. To it a little <laughs> bit. splashy. Anyhow, thank you so much. Uh, thanks to the three docs. Uh, uh, who presented cases. Thank you for attending. Coming back tomorrow morning, we're going to talk about ovarian cancer. Have a great night.